So this is step two, the editor, and this should look familiar to anyone with HTML experience. This is just a basic template for a web page. It's got a head, which has some CSS code in it, and then it's got a body, which has our JavaScript. There's two files being linked here. The first is the 3JS library, and the second is a script which detects whether or not the person loading your sketch has a browser that supports WebGL. And then in the event that, that it doesn't, it throws them a detailed error message. Then down here, we have some JavaScript. This is our 3JS template. So this setup, and I'll remove these bits for clarity, uh, should look kind of familiar to anyone that's done some creative coding in something like processing, for example. There's a setup function, and there's a draw function. So the setup function is where you're going to put anything that you want instantiated as soon as the page loads. And the draw function is everything that's going to be changing or animating. So I'll bring the rest of this back and go over it. So this first chunk creates our WebGL renderer. This next line creates our camera with some parameters. And then this line changes the Z position of our camera. So in this case, it's moving it back a bit so that we can see our mesh when we paste it in. And then this line creates our scene. Now here where it says paste your code from the GUI, we're going to go ahead and paste the code that we copied in the last step. And I'll indent this for cleanliness. And you'll notice that as soon as you paste it in, you see it rendered in the background. And if you go up to the menu at the top and you click hide code, you can toggle your editor on and off and get a better view of your sketch. Next, down here in the draw function, there's a couple lines. The first one essentially loops the draw function. It clears the screen and redraws it roughly 60 times every second. So basically, this handles the animation. And then there's another comment down here that says, experiment with the code from the snippets menu here. So if you go back to this menu up here and click on the snippets button, that'll take you to a bunch of different uh, code examples. So go ahead and click on the first one that says, rotate mesh. And that'll take you to our first code snippet. There's another comment here that says, to rotate a mesh, add the code below to your draw function. Fuck with the numbers to change the speed. Cool. So go ahead and copy that code. And then as soon as you do that, you'll notice that the cube will start spinning. And if you fuck with the numbers, the speed changes. And you can keep messing around with this and, and get a sense for, for how it works. So assuming you've messed around with code before, you should already notice that this is a different kind of editor. It's more like a live coding environment where the editor and the final rendered sketch share the same space. So you have real-time feedback. You can see your sketch change as you edit the code, which lends itself to this more experimental slash playful approach to making work. So you can literally learn this stuff by fucking around with it. Also, there's this snippets menu, which lets you get started animating by copying and pasting different snippets of code and then changing them and collaging them together. So this is what I mean when I say modeled after an experimental new media art ethic. So traditionally, we don't think of software as being political, but software is definitely not neutral. It reflects and imposes the politics of the folks who made it. So to quote Ted Nelson, the inventor of hypertext, Xanadu, the back button, and much else besides, what you can do in Microsoft Word is what Bill Gates has decided. What you can do in Oracle Database is what Larry Ellison and his crew have decided. Likewise, what you could do in Apple is what Steve Jobs and Johnny Ives have decided, and in Facebook, what Mark Zuckerberg has decided, etc. And the point isn't that the decisions they're making are evil or ill-willed. This isn't some kind of conspiracy. The point is that these decisions they've made are partly for your convenience and partly for theirs, and partly out of the stereotypes that they carry with them from the conventions of the computer field, which, as it happens, is not my field. I'm a net artist. And so my own personal politics often come into conflict when using software tools. For example, why did my QuickTime update remove those old codecs? I needed those specific codecs to make my glitch videos. What do you mean my MacBook Air is a non-user serviceable product? I need to compress air this thing. Why can't I paste animated GIFs in my Facebook wall? And why can't I copy and paste text from my Facebook app? Copying and pasting is how my brain works. The answers to these questions can be found embedded within the politics of these tools which again reflect the ethic of the small, very specific group of folks that made them. Now this playground is no less political and no less biased than any other digital tool, but it stems from a drastically different ethic. In this case, an experimental new media art ethic. Okay, so let's go back to our sketch and screw around a little more. Let's click on this snippet for swinging the camera or mesh. It says to swing the camera back and forth, add the code below to your draw function. To change the axis of the camera, swings on, change the X to Y or Z. So I'll go ahead and do that. And I'll change the X to a Y to get this swinging up and down instead of from left to right. And I'll make this number a little bigger to get a larger swing going. Cool. Let's go back to the snippets menu. Um, I really like this one for leaving trails. 
it says to leave trails, replace the renderer on line 27 with the code below. So I'll copy this, and then on line 27 I'll replace it with this new renderer snippet. So now the draw isn't clearing the previous frame before it draws a new one, so it creates this kind of like trailing effect. And then I think I'm also going to go ahead and drop down my opacity a bit. Yeah, that looks nice. Cool, I'll grab one more snippet, this time the one for multiplying meshes. So it says to multiply your mesh, place it in a for loop. So this is what a for loop looks like, and it basically says do whatever is inside this loop, i.e. within these two brackets, do that this many times. Okay, so I'll copy this first bit into my sketch, then don't forget the closing bracket. So the code you, you generated for your mesh should be in between these two brackets, and thus inside the for loop. I'll indent this, and now my mesh is being created 300 times. So it's always been created in the same spot, so we can't really notice that there's actually 300 of these. But if I go back to the snippet, it mentions here that it's probably a good idea to randomly set the position of the mesh. This way, each time it runs through the loop, it positions it randomly somewhere else in the scene. So I'm going to copy this. I'm also going to get rid of this rotation code. And I'm just going to paste this inside my for loop here. And now we can see our mesh being randomly positioned all over the scene. And I think I'm going to change this Y to Z. Nice. Okay, cool. So at this point, I think I'm ready to save the sketch and add it to my archive. Uh, but first, before you add your sketch to the archive, don't forget to sign it. Give out any shout outs or creds in the comments. I like to use this little ASCII signature. And then you're done. So you can click on Archive It, which will prompt you to name your sketch and to put your name in there. So I'll call this Jailbreak for Life, and I'll put my name down, and then click Save. 